four days um, of meeting parents, experts, uh, dietitians, pediatric neurologists, basic researchers from 26 countries, all talking about the ketogenic diet and this has been happened for the fourth time. Um, and it's just a magnificent meeting. You learn such a lot, even as a professional. Is the fact that uh, the ketogenic diet was originally designed to treat uh, children with epilepsy, is now moving into the metabolic field, is moving into the cancer field, is moving into several other fields we did, would, would have never dreamed of before that it might play a role there. And I think there's, there are great opportunities there. Because it brings together the experts in the field, it serves as a platform not only for the people who have who are involved in the field um, to exchange thoughts, get new ideas, um, sort of get criticized and um, see if the way they chose is the way they should be heading for. It's also a platform for um, the parents and um, uh, the dietitians and other uh, other people in the field to to um, get hold of experts and, to, and, and for the experts to get hold of patients and parents and see their concerns, see their view. And um, uh, thirdly, I think it's, it, it's a great platform to coordinate efforts to make it effective. And of course, it leaves an impact in the medical society if you bring uh, people together um, on a conference like this and then um, you can really convince uh, other people who were a bit skeptical about the ketogenic diet that, hey, this is something you should think about and uh, it's worth carrying it further. We have new therapies like um, the modified Atkins diet, which is a lighter ketogenic diet, which is probably very appropriate for adolescents or people having compliance problems with the diet but still needing it for the GLUT1 deficiency treatment. And we have new, co new compounds like um, the ketoester and triheptanoin still in the research phase but promising um, and um, would, they would have never come up if we wouldn't have had these conferences and these impulses of basic researchers, clinicians, parents talking together and saying hey we need to do something about it and now the first protocols are out and we are very um, excited about it. Well, I believe it is still under diagnosis, especially in adolescents and in the adult community. We know that adult neurologists haven't really recognized that entity yet as being a treatable disease and um, it was other clinical manifestations than in children, but still the same disease and potentially to be treated with a modified ketogenic diet regimen. Um, the other um, reason I think uh, it's under diagnosis is that we still have increasing numbers of patients um, worldwide and um, I get emails virtually every week. I get, I get about 10 to 15 emails with colleagues asking me, oh, we found a GLUT1 patient and can you give us some advice on what, what we should do? There is um, a GLUT1 patient data bank who's just been set up by the Texas University, Professor Pasqual, and um, it's very easy accessible on the website and on the web and you can just as a patient go to that website and enter your data and it'll be freely accessible to researchers and that way we'll, it'll tremendously help us to understand why some patients have um, still seizures on the diet, why some patients might respond to therapies, which therapies might be the best, what's the uh, side effects, what is uh, uh, the difference in clinical presentations, where are these patients, how many are there in the world. So um, that, is a, uh, that is a great chance and I'd ask all the one patients and doctors to enter the data. Well, I think one of the big discussions really will be whether we find alternative treatments to the ketogenic diet. Um, another discussion will be about novel compounds like the 3-heptanoin, which could be, um, could be used 
on top of the ketogenic diet, I believe. Um, the big challenge is understanding what this GLUT1 deficiency can actually do in patients. We have very peculiar manifestations like um, hemolytic anemia or paroxysmal exertion-induced movement disorders that we have never before would have thought this is GLUT1, but it is. We found mutations and now we have to tackle that and have to see um, how we can, uh, how can explain why some people have a hemolytic anemia, others have epilepsy, and others may just have movement disorder. We need a clinical classification system, definitely, and we need to um, support, especially now that the patients we diagnose as children grow older, we have to, to um, accompany this, what we call transition into adulthood, um, past puberty, and then into the adult medicine.